So, my name is Craig Galanti, and I am a resident of Porter Ranch, 26 years, raised a family, run a small business out of my home. I'm not a, not a member of Save Porter Ranch. I'm not a member of Food and Water Watch. I'm a lot like you. I'm, I'm just simply a resident that got very involved. Quick, quick raise of hands. How many from the San Fernando Valley? Okay. How many from the gas company or their legal firms? Leave your hands up, please. Okay. <laughs> You're probably here. And that's fine, and that's okay. Because I think what you'll learn here today, and I assume you're some of their better and their brighter people, and you always have choices of where you work or who your clients are. Okay? And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but just you should be aware. And we'll talk about those kind of things here. So this is a very long anticipated presentation from Dr. Nordella. We have, uh, we have a few speakers that will, will come in here in a minute. But I am probably the least important person in the room. But there's some things I want to share with you. Let me read something to you regarding the largest methane blowout in U.S. history. The disaster that occurred at Aliso Canyon is a singular, unprecedented event. See if you agree with these statements. There's never been such an extraordinary toxic release, so we are in uncharted waters in determining what health impacts, if any, could result in the long term from these exposures. To not demand an appropriate health study would be to deny the facts of the situation and ignore the health needs of the affected community. Who would agree with that? <laughs> Applause is welcome, please. Would you like to know who wrote this? The LA County Department of Public Health. These ambitions are true, these ambitions are correct, but things happened that got in the way. So not only us as a community, largest methane blowout in US history, a lot of attention, a lot of media showed up, a lot of public officials showed up, a lot of agencies showed up, but the net result after almost two years is there's no long-term health study. There's not even a root cause analysis. I'm gonna go quickly because there's a lot more important people that wanna get up here and talk. But look, there's no seismic study, there's no emergency response that the first responders, our local fire, is supporting. They didn't even put subsurface valves, and that would have stopped this whole blowout from happening. They didn't even do it today. There's no independent methane leak monitoring system. And this is, to me, is very, very important. There's no demonstrated need for this facility to exist. But yet it does. And none of these things happen, but why? That's the key word, folks. Right? And influence could take a lot of different forms. What do you suppose, just shout it out, what do you suppose influenced no root cause, no health study? What? Money. Money. Thank you. Money, of course. Money. Money. money again. And money can take its form in a lot of different ways, right? <clears throat> Political contributions, a job, job security, okay? But there's other influences too. Alignment of agendas. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? There's familiar relationships. Your sister could be on the board of directors. <laughs> okay, a few more things. Quick, quick little history lesson, if you will, bear with me just for a moment. There was 115 wells up there. I live very near this facility, and I didn't even know about all this. Blowout happens, we all know this, infamous date, October 23rd, 2015. One and a half years later, there's a total overhaul of the field. Aliso Canyon is under immense retrofitting. I live very near there, trucks were in and out constantly. Here's, my, here's one of my favorites. Dogger and the PUC touts repeatedly Aliso Canyon is the most heavily reviewed gas storage facility in the country. Well, I guess so, because Dogger only allowed 36 or 31% of those wells that were originally up there to be opened for partial operation. And what that means is there was significantly reduced capacity of the field and pressure in the system. So we said we did our homework 
and only 36, or only a th less than a third could be opened. Of those 36, guys remember just a few weeks ago, about a month ago, a third of those failed. So I did the math. 21% of the original wells are in partial use today. So after all the rigor, all the touted, uh, you know, most, most reviewed field in the country, only 21% pass. Okay, I'm sorry, right? If you're a freshman in college, <laughs> and you are very ambitious, and you worked really hard, and you get a 21% in your organic chemistry, you would likely conclude, this is not the major for me. Yet, Aliso Canyon, with only the best of the best wells open, has failed the mandatory flyover leaks. How long has Aliso Canyon been leaking? If these are the best of the best, highly scrutinized, but they can't pass a flyover, how long has it been leaking? 44 years. Okay, it gets worse, right? I did the math again. 722 days, and Liso Canyon has only had two days of withdrawal. And I hope a lot of you go to the bar afterwards and talk to the people that are in the know about those two days. They're very suspicious. It really didn't need to happen. So two winters, two summers, including this amazingly terrible heat wave we had this summer in 2017. But why is Aliso still open? Influence again. So I want you to ask yourselves, what can I do? You can be informed, and if you become involved, you too become influential. And we're gonna help you today with the informed and how to become involved. Dr. Nardella is going to lay out for you some amazing stuff, and some really dedicated and talented people are going to help you become involved, specifically Food and Water Watch and Save Porter Ranch. So if you have those two things in the combination of becoming influenced, what galvanizes it? What strengthens it? Organization, right? So what the folks that want this field to stay open and pollute us and poison us and all the rest of the things is a fragmented group because they're far better at being organized and aligned, politically, have political influence, legal influence. But if we remain informed, involved, and organized, our influence create is uh, exponentially greater. Okay? I'd like to introduce someone who has been exceedingly well informed and exceedingly involved, and one of our best advocates, I'd like to introduce Henry Stern. <laughs> Senator, come on up, Henry. Thank you, Craig. Uh, my name's Henry Stern. I'm your state senator. I live in Canoga Park and have been working on this issue since the 23rd, actually, since that date, I was the environmental attorney working for your previous senator, Senator Pavley, and wrote a bill called SB 380 uh, that actually required the root cause analysis to be complete and a safety review to be complete before this, this field could even be considered to be reopened. But they ignored that, and the courts somehow didn't know how to read the law and thought that this administration was somehow immune from pressure and didn't have to obey the wills of our community and the rest of the state of California. What I want to say is, you know, the important people in this room today are really not me, even beyond Dr. Nordella, it's, it's you. Uh, folks like Craig and Jane and Helen and the Crown family and Susan and Matt and the people who woke up and have been fighting for your community without any monetary gain or, or promise of influence, but because we'll only survive this thing if you all put your time and your energy through this. 
and all the questions that you're going to leave here today facing, because we have way, way more questions than answers. And having reviewed Dr. Nordella's work, uh, I'm left with far too many questions, deeply concerning questions, questions that you shouldn't have to sit with and wonder about late at night, about how your kids are going to be the next day, what impact this blowout is going to have on your health in the long term, what you're going to end up having to pay the price uh, for this incident that you didn't cause, a community that you moved to to live your lives and send your kids to school and go about your, your day. But you can't just be normal citizens and go about your day anymore. That, that past is gone. You now need to be awakened, and you are. And so I wouldn't have any standing at all to go about doing the work I do up in the Capitol, fighting up against a big machine without you. So I want to thank each and every one of you for having supported this grassroots effort and given me a little bit of standing up in Sacramento to rage against that machine. Thank you. But I wanted to be very clear about something today. That facility should have never been reopened. Never, never. Should have never been reopened. Governor Brown has all the authority he needs to shut that facility down now and forever, and he must. We have to shut Aliso down now and forever. Now and forever. And I'm not going to stop until we get there. And you can't stop either. You can't stop either. You can't stop. It's not going to be easy, but the truth is on our side. And the fact that we still don't know what chemicals they've emitted from that facility, why there was barium on your couches, why we're going to find examples of certain chemicals here that really aren't associated with just natural gas and mercaptan, some standard business as usual kind of leak here. That's what the gas company is going to tell you. But I trust science over politics. And today we're going to learn things that defy the politics. And that's our job, is to be beyond politics and to find ways to tell our story beyond our community and let everyone know all throughout Los Angeles and anywhere else in California and anywhere else in this country that justice is indivisible, that the injustice that has been perpetrated upon our community is an injustice that affects us all. And you can't isolate Porter Ranch and the North San Fernando Valley and say, well, that's, you know, that's the middle class, that's the suburbs, and we don't matter. Right? You're not dealing with poverty in Southeast Los Angeles or dealing, you know, you're not out in Pacoima or you're not in Flint, Michigan or you're not in the Deep South or you're not being hit by a hurricane. You know what? There is an arc of justice that is one unified line and we have to bend that arc in our favor to help everybody here because everyone's going to pay the price. You just had to bear the brunt of it initially, but all the ratepayers of Southern California are on the hook too. Because what the gas company wants to do is they want to keep all the profits and stick you with the bill. And it's not just you they want to stick with the bill. They want to stick all of Southern California with that bill. And that's actually what connects us, right? Because if they're having to pay for this thing too, the rest of Los Angeles is going to wake up. I, we passed a bill through the legislature, which is sitting on the governor's desk today. And we, I, would, I would ask your help uh, to urge him to sign it, SB 801. We could not get closure through the legislature this year. We're going to try again next year. We're going to try to get these chemicals brought into the light of day. But we did get a bill through that said all the penalties and fines that the PUC, we hope, imposes on this gas company. And I believe they will. I believe they will do the right thing. And if they don't, we're going to make them do the right thing. But all those penalties under SB 801 have to, have to be set aside for us to mitigate the health impacts, to pay for that public health study, because a million dollars will not do, and the South Coast measly settlement with the gas company won't do, but we're going to have to make sure that we have the funds necessary to get you all answers. So 
you know, today's not about me. It's about you all starting to peel back the onion here and really find out what's going on. But I just want to pledge my um, undying support and daily diligence along with my staff. This is the top priority of my office. It's the reason I ran for office in the first place. It's the only reason I do what I do. So thank you. Um, it takes courage. It takes courage. You all have shown that courage. So thank you for stepping up in large ways and small. Um, and we got your back. I promise you that. So take care. Henry Stern, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Henry. Actually, I met Henry. I had, I had no idea who you were. You were at one of the events at the, uh, the, one of the churches in, in Porter Ranch. And you were just walking around, and, I'm, and it was after everything had been presented, Pavley was there, many others. And I just looked at this guy, and I go, this guy just knows what's going on. He was standing there by himself, and I went over to talk to him. And I said, so you seem involved. What, what do you take, what's your take on this? And you might not remember this, Henry. You meet a lot of people. He said to me, I've been fighting these guys for a long time, and the community needs to stick it out for the long haul because these guys are a tough adversary. Okay? He's been true to his word. He's partnered with us. His door has been open. Thank you, Henry. Very much appreciated. Okay. So uh, our next speaker is R. Rex Parrish from Parrish Law Firm. Rex. Good afternoon. You know, normally when I do some presentation, I like to figure out a way to get everybody up and say something really joyful and, you know, get you in a good place. But that I couldn't figure that out today. Uh, because what we've discovered is much worse than we thought. Much worse. Uh, and, you know, I, I find it interesting that, you know, the people that are really involved in this, they're, they spike with rage occasionally. You know, like Matt, where's Matt? Yeah. He, he'll spike with rage. And there he is, he's back there. And how, how else could he behave when you know what they're doing? When you know that you have these people who know better, who should, I mean, so many of them, allowing this thing to continue, 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 knowing that children are being affected by this. And what I mean by this, I mean, we're risking their lives with this. And, but there's a lot of reasons. We've been on it for two years now. We've been, you know, we've got about 12 people just in our office alone that do, don't do anything but look through documents, you know. And it's amazing. It's like a eureka. You know, you found a document and it tells a little bit more of the story. And it goes way back. Uh, part of that story is what they've done to the water, not just the air, you know. Uh, Porter Ranch is right at the apex of where the aquifer that feeds the San Fernando Valley is. And everything goes into the San Fernando Valley water. The, uh, there's a lot of reasons why they, they can't close this. And it has nothing to do with the economy of gas production. It has to do with just the extent of what they've done. And as other communities, Another reason why they are fighting so hard against you is because other communities, they'd have to do something with them. I mean, they've literally poisoned the Southern California uh, groundwater in many places. Uh, and, you know, their, their, their attitude is the solution to pollution is dilution. You know, <laughs> does, does that make sense to anybody? But that really is what they, how they go about uh, dealing with this. Dr. Nardella is, is one of the heroes of this, you know. And, you know, oh, by the way, I forgot. This is Patricia Oliver, if you don't know her. For, for two years, seven days a week, all she does is this case. Uh, 
She, she, wait a minute, that's really, I, I misspoke. She, she also does poisoning the water in Kern County that the oil industry does. Uh, but that's all she does. And she knows more about what they've done than anyone alive. I'm convinced of that. She knows more than they know because she's, you know, brought it all together. One of the things she did, before I go into what Dr. Nadella discovered, was she brought in a guy who worked on the BP uh, case it, from the industry, you know, and what his job was after the blowout was to train the Coast Guard on how to police the, the drilling in the ocean because they changed who is regulating it now for very good reasons. And he's this grizzled guy, you know, that's been in the oil industry his whole life. And, you know, he's about my age. And he's got all the wrinkles and sun damage, you know. You, you get the idea of who he is. And his, his task was to come in for several days and teach our, the people in our office working on this everything we could learn about injection wells. You know, the drilling of them, the maintenance of them, everything we could learn. And in the course of that, he's hearing the story of Porter Ranch. And when we get to the part about all the kids with nosebleeds, he literally started to cry because he knew what that meant. It wasn't an irritation of the nostrils. It was these children were being poisoned. And remember how they came out and announced to the world, oh, it's just an irritation. It's just an it, It's People should be in prison. And why they're not is, is beyond me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm also the mayor of a city. And so when I hear things like influence, I know a little bit more from the other side of exactly what that means. My wife and I have been blessed, and I, I didn't have to get campaign contributions. So it just... You know, it's just a, something I fund. But, but I've been in it for eight years now. And what influence really is, it's relationship. You know, I have to be very careful who I listen to. And that's what's happening in this case. Because they put me on that uh, task force with the county. And they're doing all of this investigation of the injection wells all over the county. But they refuse to do any investigation of what goes on underneath. I said, I don't care what it looks like on top. I don't care how pretty it is. What's going on down hole? You know, that's, that's what kills you. You know, no, no invest, oh, that, the state does that. Uh, the state is appointed by the governor and we all know that story. Uh, you know, it, it, it's rigged against us, make no mistake. Anyway, so Patricia tells me about this guy named Dr. Nardello and the testing he's doing. And I've, I'm 65 and I've learned to be very suspicious of, <laughs> very suspicious of people who are do-gooders, you know? I mean, it, because when you start looking under the surface, you oftentimes wish you had looked sooner, you know? Uh, and so when she's telling me about not Dr. Nordella, I said, well, yeah, maybe. And then let's do our own independent testing. And everything he said was confirmed with independent labs. Everything he was telling us. And what he's telling us is a horror show. I mean, he really is one of the heroes of this. He, he, he sacrificed his career. He invested his own money, and he suffered public humiliation because the gas company has now targeted him, you know, and, and anything they can do to lower his uh, stature, they do. Uh, it, that's how they work. You know, in the task force with the county, you go there and th there's citizen participation. There's Sorrell Associates. There's, you know, you go all through all the lobbyist organizations. That's who's there. And they all work for the gas company. You know, the, the company that tested the water, the surface water when all this was happening, they worked for the gas company that the county hired. 
You know, I, I, and, in, and what, do, what do the Board of Supervisors do? They look at what does the public want. And if you're not at those meetings, if you're not screaming that this has to stop, these lobbyists are screaming that it has to keep going. You know? And when I, I always like to reverse roles with people to see how they're seeing it, because you know, I always see it differently. And how they're seeing it is they don't see this. They don't see this level of concern. All they see is the people that they have lunch with occasionally are the only ones there. They must be the only ones that are interested. I, I don't know that it, they're as much to blame as we are for, for not participating more because the consequences are so, so severe. And let's talk about that. Remember when uh, Supervisor Antonovich was concerned about the benzene? that was coming out of that, that hole, and the gas company kept saying, no, nah, it's just minute, it's just trace amounts. Remember that? I mean, there were those public reports to agencies that it's just a minute amount. Well, that benzene was much more than a minute amount. When UCLA came in and started doing the testing, one of the things they did was a wipe test. That's what, that's what we call it. Where they wiped the surface of the house with these these rag, well, these, what do you call them? Wipes, I guess. <laughs> and they test them to see what's in them. And the benzene in 26% of the homes, not all of the homes, but in 26% of the homes, let's go to the next one. Yeah, 28%. Was significant. And let's go to the next one. One, it was 10 times what OSHA would shut down a job site for. And it's all gonna be different in the homes because if you're a good housekeeper and maybe your neighbor isn't, you're gonna have less on the wipes than, than your neighbor would have. You know, it's not, a, it's not a static environment. So the public health department, they just tested the air. How is that possible? You got UCLA telling them to do surface wipes. And all of a sudden, no, we're just going to test the air. That's what happened. A lot of that stuff, depending on if you took advantage of getting the home cleaned and how well they cleaned the home. Did they clean, clean the vents? You know, that, that was the real poison point here, is you draw air from the outside, you air condition it. The vents have this stuff in it. It's still there. It's still there. And it's still being leaked. And remember, that I mentioned this part on the 22nd, not the 23rd, the day before, we found a document on the millions of documents we're looking at to one of the water agencies, just one of them, that benzene was leaking into the, into the water supply. That was the day before. And they make reference to a rat hole in one of the wells. But it's at the same level, the same depth, as the SS-25 well. So we're almost positive that's what it is. A rat hole is a serious event. That's what they call it when the well blows, you know, the casing blows out. They knew this thing had been blown at least the day before. And it wasn't until it got worse and blew out at the, at the surface that they finally had to report it to Air Quality Management District. And they waited three days to do that. Dr. Nardella is going to be, tell you more about this. But the benzene turns in, is it ethyl benzene? Is that how? Emission. Yep, it's already in, in the emission. Okay. Oh, that's right. It turns in, see all the stuff turns into different stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you're still testing for it, and you're still showing up in your blood and urine. How long has it been since they sealed that well? Now, that doesn't surprise any of us. Because throughout Porter Ranch, there's these old abandoned wells that they covered up. Some of them were capped, some of them weren't. But a lot of them are leaking. And they've been put, how many of you smelled gas in that community long before the, right? How many smell it now occasionally? Right? It's not because it's leaking out of SS-25. It's because it's leaking up out of those old wells, you know? And it always has been. 
And when people would call in, they'd say, oh, we got a little leak, meaning it was like somebody's house is leaking. They had some cover story. But that's all it was, was a cover story. They've known for a very long time. Remember that stuff about mercaptans not being uh, poisonous, not being toxic? It was just designed to alert you to the... Go onto the internet, type in merca mercaptans and see what they tell you. It's toxic. The, the, the study that the health department released saying it wasn't, read the study. It says that six months later, people are still sick. That's what it said, and that's when the study was over. You can't trust the government on this. You can't trust the gas company. And none of us, we wouldn't have to trust anybody if they just closed the damn field, right? I mean, It's not, it's not rocket science that they've got a serious problem. One of the concerns I think they have is just how deep that problem goes, meaning how far into the San Fernando Valley does it go? I, I think it's much worse than any of us thought six months ago. Acrolene, Porter Ranch Homes, 96% positive. More importantly, the schools the schools are positive for it. That's a poison. And, but look where, the, where it compares. You know, Phillips Refinery, and the heart of the refinery has less in the environment than you do. It, it makes zero sense to say that they've solved anything there. Good. And look what it causes, asthma. And cancer is the big one. You know, let me tell you a little story. 12 years ago, 23andMe opened. Might have been 10 years ago. Anybody do 23andMe? It's where you spit in this tube, send it in, and they give you your DNA. You know? So I do that. And one of the things I'm prone to is prostate cancer. I have the gene for it. So now I'm watching for it. And so as soon as my PSA level went up a little bit, I go to the doctor, they do the exam, oh, you're fine, don't worry about it. But I'm thinking, I got that gene, you know? I got the gene. So I went to another doctor. Turns out I had a fast-moving cancer. And it wasn't slow-moving, it was fast-moving. Had I not known that I had that gene, I never would have got the second test. And that was like six years ago, I'm fine, you know? They, they, Got rid of it, cut it out, it's all good. Had I waited six months, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. What does that mean to you? You're susceptible to all kinds of cancers now that you wouldn't have been otherwise. And it means you have to spend the rest of your life, every year or so, getting thorough exams. Any danger sign, you have to take action because you're now at risk, because we don't know how long you've been exposed to this stuff, and we don't know how your body's gonna react to it, and we don't know what other stuff it's mixed up with. You know? We do know that the people who are in the bedrooms that face the formation are having far more significant health problems than people whose window faced the other way. And we keep seeing that as we get our questionnaires back. And, you know, benzene's always the big one. They knew that. They knew that. The whole time, they'd have a press release day after day after day that there's nothing to be concerned about. Remember? I mean, unabashedly, nothing to be concerned about. Well, how can you report benzene leaking into the water supply the day before, and then three days later start reporting that no benzene, no problems. Is that it? Now, Dr. Nordello is gonna give you the science. He's gonna tell you what he's discovered. Listen to him, because 
what we've learned is the real deal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rex. And Dr. Nordell is a real deal, and you're going to hear from him in just a minute. There's a couple things that uh, I want to do. And I'm, okay, real quick, what happened in Flint, Michigan? Quickly. Lead in the water. Lead in the water, right? Okay. Who's ever heard of Mona, Dr. Mona Hanna Tisha? Anybody ever heard of that name? Okay. I wouldn't expect you to. But Dr. Mona, I like to call her, um, was a physician at the local children's hospital in Flint, Michigan. And she noticed something. She was the, the doctor that found the toxin in her patient's blood. We're going to see an interview about the whole story. But what I want you to focus on is the incredible similarities of what's happening to us. Because Dr. Mona was met with great opposition. The bullies came out. And who were the bullies? Fortunately, yeah, go ahead, shout them out. Who were the bullies? The ones that are supposed to be protecting us but didn't. Take a look at this video. It's a public health crisis of massive proportions. Lead in the water supply in Flint, Michigan. People breaking out in rashes, losing hair. The doctor who sounded the alarm was ignored, but not anymore. ABC's Alex Perez is following the investigation in Flint tonight. Three, two, one. It was supposed to be a moment of triumph. Yeah. Cheers erupted as the then mayor of Flint, Michigan, officially turned off the water feed from Detroit. Here's the Flint. Here's the Flint. Here, here, here. And began pulling its supply from the local Flint River. Little did they know that this cost-cutting move would have devastating consequences. Chief reviews Detroit water, but at what cost? Yeah, Everybody's health, people dropping over dead, getting sick. Clean water! Now, almost two years later, Flint is in a state of federal emergency. Our children should not have to be worried about uh, the water that they're drinking in American cities. That's not something that we should accept. President Obama releasing $80 million in aid to Michigan to help Flint repair its water infrastructure as National Guards continue to cart in thousands of bottles of water and filters. One. But on that day, back in April of 2014, as the mayor pressed the button, no one knew what they had put into action. Just weeks after the switch, complaints began pouring in about the discolored and foul-smelling water running from the taps. And there were the mysterious ailments. You can see in these photos of two-year-old Sincere Smith, who had become the face of this public crisis, suffering from severe rashes, hair loss. At the time, his mother had no idea what it was. And she was not alone. My son Jordan, he's been in the ER twice, early summertime with the rash all over his body from the water. Today we went in for high fever, cramping, sore throat. Mothers like Brandy Luck were starting to turn up at emergency rooms all over Flint. And this is Jaden. Jaden was seen today for a severely sore throat, very swollen, very red. Longtime residents Jacob Urek and his wife had taken to bathing their young children with bottled water. You hear of all these legionaries disease or uh, the dermatitis, all, all these different things that are happening more and more frequently and uh, nobody's accountable. Uh, no one's been prosecuted, no one's, no one's served a penalty for this except for the people of the city of Flint. For almost two years, complaints from the city of 100,000 residents went unanswered. But independent test results were beginning to provide a chilling answer. High levels of lead in the water. So lead is an irreversible neurotoxin. Once it is in your body, the damage is done. Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, director of pediatrics at the Hurley Medical Center in Flint, was one of the first to sound the alarm. And what we noticed was that after the water switch, um, the percentage of children with elevated blood lead levels doubled in the entire city of Flint, and then in some neighborhoods it actually tripled. But when she released her findings in September of 2015, Right away we, we were attacked. We were told we were wrong, that we were unfortunate researchers, that we were causing near hysteria. Two weeks later, officials could no longer ignore the signs and officially declared the water unsafe. 
And this week, the fallout, as over 270 pages of internal emails and documents came to light. It's a damning look into how officials ignored blatant warning signs. The emergency order was yesterday. Some of those signs were uncovered by this man, EPA investigator Miguel Del Toro. I never imagined that, that this would happen in the first place. He was one of the first to warn about lead in the water. After resident Leanne Walters called in a complaint in early 2015, Del Toro went out to her house to test the water there. What Del Toro found was extremely high levels of lead in the tap water, water that he said was causing Walters' children's hair to fall out in clumps. I think that if it weren't for Leanne, this may have you know, gone a lot longer. After talking to the State Department of Environmental Quality, Del Toro made another stunning discovery. The river water being fed into the taps was not being treated with anti-corrosion agent as required by law. It's inconceivable that you would allow a system with lead service lines, a large system, not to have the treatment in place. In the spring of 2015, Del Toro warned the agency that the state was understating the lead levels in the city's water. Writing in a memo, staffers have essentially downplayed or ignored warning signs and that the whole town may have much higher lead levels than the compliance results indicated. You give them that warning, it seems like they blew you off. Do they not know what they're doing? I don't know what their decision process was on this. Internal memos also show that state officials dismissed multiple warnings, spending months denying the lead contamination until October of last year. It's upsetting um, to see what's happened there. Shouldn't have happened. Shouldn't have happened. When Dan Wyant, the director of the Department of Environmental Quality, wrote in an email, I believe now we've made a mistake. Corrosion control should have been required from the beginning. The admission has been met with public anger. In a city where more than 40% live below the poverty line, residents are asking if they're being left behind. If this was a highly generated economy and it was booming here, um, then yeah, it, it wouldn't have made it past three months. Flint's water supply has since reverted back to Detroit's Lake Huron, but the damage has already been done. An independent task force conducted a review of the state's handling of the water crisis and found the DEQ's response to the public to be one of aggressive dismissal, belittlement, and attempts to discredit these efforts. The head of the EPA's regional office in Chicago, which covers Michigan, has since resigned after Governor Rick Snyder officially apologized to the residents of Flint. I say tonight, as I have before, I am sorry and I will fix it. The apology coming just hours after attorneys filed a class action lawsuit against the governor and state and city officials. But Dr. Hannah Atisha says apologies don't mean that much to a mother wondering what will happen to her child. So she's traumatized about the consequences of lead, but they're also traumatized about what they've been through the last two years, an entire betrayal of governmental agencies. Or to a city that will have to live with the consequences. You expect when you turn on your water, you expect it to be drinkable. And you've been told for almost two years that it's safe. Um, so there's significant trauma in our community. So we are definitely trying to instill hope. For Nightline, I'm Alex Perez. Flint, Michigan. Strike a chord. Is it relevant? Does it hit the issues? Okay. So maybe this message will get out while I'm doing some housekeeping. Those bullies that are in the wait, I want to challenge them for, you have a choice. You can either become adversarial in what you're about to see and hear, or you can lean into the conversation with an open mind and discover what's truly going on. 